Thank you for listening to our church podcast, where it is our joy to share helpful truths from the Bible. We pray this serves as one more tool to help develop leaders within our church and community who love and honor Jesus and reveal it by loving others. If you have any questions or comments about any of the messages, we invite you to join us on any Wednesday, 6 p.m., for a group discussion on the passages and sermons found here. Scripture reading will be in Luke chapter 18. I'll be reading verses 18 through verse 30. Go ahead and remain seated, and I'll read these verses for us. Luke 18, beginning in verse 18. It says, A ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the the age to come eternal life. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom as we seek to study and apply your scripture rightly. Uh, Help each of us to have a heart that is willing and able to accept, receive, and apply what it is that you have for us today. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Excuse me. We are um, concluding our study of the rich young ruler in Luke 18. And as we've seen the last couple of weeks, surrendering our lives to Jesus as Lord includes surrendering our money and possessions to him as well. I think that's clear from this text. As Christians, we are to manage what God has entrusted to us according to his will. And so the question is, uh, what exactly does that look like? What does God want us to do with our finances, and how can we know? Uh, That's what we'll be seeking to answer this morning. Does God call us as Christians to give away whatever money and possessions we have? Is that part of what it means to follow Jesus? Some people have read this text and come to that conclusion that, you know, Jesus tells the man, go sell everything you have, give everything you have away, and come follow me. And so they take that as normative to all Christians. Another question that people may have reading this is, can rich people be saved? Uh, Maybe another way to say it, uh, does following Jesus means you cannot be rich? Is it wrong to be rich? Is it right to be poor? These are questions that arise from this account. We're going to look this morning at six points from Scripture about the Christian's relationship to money. And these will overlap uh, some, but hopefully you'll leave with a a well-rounded view of the subject. Uh, Basically what I've done is try to condense everything the Bible teaches about money into one sermon. And uh, we'll we'll kind of jump back and forth between Luke 18 and several of the texts as we go. First of all, the Bible teaches us, and this perhaps is the main point in our text in Luke 18, that we are to value Christ above riches. This is the lesson that the rich young ruler needed to learn. Verse 22 says, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Notice he tells him to give up his wealth and follow him. As we've said the last couple of weeks, this man was blind to his sin. Uh, He thought that he had kept the commandments perfectly throughout his life, but Jesus knew that he was covetous, that he loved money. His wealth was the idol of his heart, and so Jesus says to him, "I'll, I'll give you a test. Uh, Get rid of all your money and come follow me. And he says, no way, Uh, which was proof of his idolatry. He valued his money and possessions more than Jesus and his kingdom. He was unwilling to give up his wealth to gain the kingdom. He's really the perfect example of what Jesus talked about in his famous parable of the soils in Mark 4. Uh, This is the parable where about those who would hear the word of Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, and the different soils represent different people in their Uh, their attitude, their heart, when they hear the call of Christ to repent and follow him. Verse 18, Jesus says that there was some some of the seed that was sown among thorns. Uh, They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches 
and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The rich ruler in Luke 18 is this third soil where the seed lands among thorns. He has a real interest in following Christ, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things choke that interest, choke that desire for Christ. He demonstrates what that phrase, the deceitfulness of riches, means. Because riches deceive us when they convince us that they are more valuable than Christ. This is, in the end, a matter of the heart. You can begrudgingly give away some of your money and not be a Christian. Because it's not really about how much you give away or how much you keep. It's about your mindset. Is Jesus your treasure? Is following him and living for him your highest aim in life? Matthew 13, 44, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Uh, notice this proverbial man sells everything that he has to purchase this field with the treasure, and he does so joyfully. And as I've said before, why would somebody do that? Why would somebody gladly sell everything, give everything that they have away in order to purchase this field? There's only one logical answer, because he considers the treasure that he is gaining to be more valuable than the total of everything he's giving up to get it. This is the attitude of one who values Christ and his kingdom above his own life and ambitions and pleasures. Whatever the cost, whatever God may ask of me, if I gain Christ, it is worth it. So number one, the first point is value Christ above riches. Number two, do not seek to be rich. I'm going to balance this out in a minute because the next point is that Christians should work hard to make money. We're going to get there. But we are not to seek to become rich. Look at some text here. First Timothy chapter 6 Paul says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Do we really believe that? Do we believe that desiring to be rich leads to a snare and ultimately destruction. Verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, this desire for riches that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, as we're going to see, this is not to say that money is necessarily evil and the more you have, the worse you are. That's not the point. But clearly, we as Christians are not to make our focus gaining wealth for ourselves. Now, this is why Jesus doesn't tell us pray for riches, but rather pray for our needs to be met. Luke 11, verse 3, he says, give us each day our daily bread. This should be the heart cry of the Christian. Proverbs 30, verse 8, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. And so Christians are not to seek to become rich. In fact, that desire is a temptation. It's a snare that leads to all kinds of problems. Some of us have these issues. We're workaholics. Uh, this is our temptation. We love to work. We love to make more and more money. Every chance there is for overtime, we take it. And some of us get our satisfaction and fulfillment out of seeing a bank account grow. We desire to be rich. And we tell ourselves, I'll be satisfied once I have this much. And if you want to know if this is your problem, see what happens when you hit that number. If it's always increasing, then this may be a tendency that you have. Christians should not seek to be rich. Our focus in life should not be more and more money or possessions. Number three, Christians ought to work hard to earn money, but not just for ourselves. Ephesians 4 verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to give, uh, sorry, something to share with anyone in need. Okay, so notice there, Christians are to work hard, doing honest work, earning money, but notice the reason. He does this so that he may have something to share. Uh, we don't work in order just to gain riches for ourselves, but that principle of valuing Christ above money and don't desire to be rich, that doesn't mean that basically it's a bad idea to make lots of money, and the most godly and spiritual people are the poor people. That is not uh, the point of those principles. In reality, the Bible presents us with four categories of people. 
There are unrighteous poor people, and there are unrighteous rich people. There are righteous poor people, and there are righteous rich people. It's not as simple as as saying, uh, if you're rich, you're a sinner, and if you're poor, you're right with God. Let me show you what I mean. Proverbs 10, verse 2, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. Okay, so here we're introduced to the unrighteous rich. Uh, These are the people who gain wealth by wickedness. This would be the unrighteous rich. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Okay, so God takes care of the needs of the righteous, those who are following him. But he brings to poverty some because of their wickedness. So verse 2 says that some are rich because of sin. They gain their treasures by wickedness. And then verse 3 says some are poor because of sin. Some people are wicked and God brings them to craving or poverty because of their wickedness. Verse 4, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Now, this is something we all see around us, especially in America. Many of the people who are poor in our society are poor because of laziness. That doesn't mean all people that are poor are so because of laziness, but some certainly are. Notice that verse 4 says that diligence makes rich. A gathering in summer is wise and leads to wealth, whereas sleeping and not working is shameful and leads to poverty. And so here we're introduced to that third category, the righteous rich. Some people gain riches by wickedness. Others gain riches by diligent work. Some people are poor because they are oppressed. We'll see that in a minute. Others are poor because it's their own fault, either because they're lazy or they make foolish financial choices. And so we can't just think rich people are good Uh, poor people are bad, or rich people are bad, poor people are good. It's more complicated than that. Depends on how you became rich or poor, and in the case of the rich, what you're doing with those riches, whether we're spending it all on ourselves or using it for Christ. Proverbs 13, verse 18. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. Okay, so some people are poor, because they refuse to listen to instruction. We all have somebody like this in our life. Uh, Most of us probably have relatives like this. They always complain about being poor. They ask you for money all the time. And yet, when you encourage them uh, to stop gambling or to get a stable job or whatever the issue is, they just ignore you. And so they are poor because they ignore instruction. Proverbs 14, verse 23, in all toil there is profit, but mere talk leads, uh, tends only to poverty. Okay, so we see consistently throughout Scripture the promoting of hard work, toil, earning your money, diligently working to make money is a good and honorable thing. Pro- uh, Proverbs 20, verse 13, Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. Again, the emphasis of working diligently and not being lazy. Uh, some people, according to this verse, are poor because they won't get out of bed in the morning and go to work. Not only is laziness the cause for some poverty, but also wastefulness. Uh, Proverbs 21, verse 17, whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. And so some are rich, not because they are lazy uh, and won't work diligently to make money, but because they mishandle the money they have. Some people are poor, uh, I should say, because they, maybe they do work diligently, maybe they do make money, and yet they waste it. They waste it on wine or other excesses or addictions. Proverbs 23, 21. The drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. Okay, so clearly then, there are some who are poor because of sin. Uh, Laziness, wastefulness, foolishness, and so on. And there are some who are rich because of diligent work. Uh, But, Proverbs 28, 6. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Okay, so poverty is not always because of sin. There are some people who walk in integrity, and yet they are poor. And there are some who are crooked in their ways, and yet they are rich. So it's not as simple as saying uh, rich people are hardworking, good people, poor are, all, are, are lazy and, and wasteful people. Uh, Proverbs thirteen twenty three: The fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. So here's a man who is working hard and yet is poor because of injustice. His poverty is the result of oppression. Uh, In the book of Luke, we've seen some of these people who really have no hope 
of escaping poverty. Uh, lepers, for instance, who were ostracized from society, uh, they had to remain outside of the city gates. They could not work a job. They were destined to uh, likely starve to death. Widows in that day were not allowed to have many jobs. They were not allowed to have education. They were kept poor as a result. And to someone like this, uh, the righteous who are poor, God has a heart of compassion for them. Psalm 72, verse 1. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people, the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people. Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. And so there you see God talking about his love and concern for those who are poor because of their oppression. And so there are these four categories of people then. You have rich and poor, some of both groups who are righteous and unrighteous. Some people are rich because of diligent work and honest toil and, and wise financial planning. Others are rich because they oppress people and gain their wealth dishonestly. Some people are poor because of injustice and oppression. Others are poor because of laziness or wastefulness. And so we need to think very carefully about drawing direct application from Scripture to our day on these matters. Uh, the fact of the matter is, all of us in this room are incredibly rich compared to the way people lived in biblical times. Uh, the poorest in America live like kings compared to the rest of the world throughout history. And so it's easy for us to think, well, I'm not rich, so I don't have to worry about any of this. Uh, but the reason we automatically think of ourselves as not rich is because we're comparing ourselves to all of the other rich people around us some of whom might be way richer than us. Also, poverty in the days in which Scripture was written was very different than it is today, largely different. As I've said already, often people were poor because of who they were, or who their parents were, or what gender they were, what disease they had. And there was some issue that was beyond their control. And so these people would be destined to live in poverty for the rest of their life. There was really no hope of them ever uh, working their way out of their financial difficulties. There was nothing they could do about it. If you remember back in Luke 16, we saw a leper named Lazarus, a righteous man who sat outside the gates of a rich man and begged for leftover food. This is what poverty looked like in the ancient world. In America, we often think of people who live in government housing with heat and air conditioning and food stamps to provide their needs as poor. And in a sense, they are compared to others, but let's not suggest that that is somehow the same thing as poverty looked like back then, or what it looks like in other parts of the world today, uh, where even starvation is a common occurrence. And so putting this all together then, the biblical teaching on poverty and wealth is nuanced. It's not necessarily a virtue to be poor. Some rich people are sinning because their heart is set on money, true. Also, plenty of poor people are sinning because they're lazy or foolish with their money. So don't think, well, this sermon about money doesn't have anything to do with me because I'm broke, as though that's a badge of honor. And I understand there are some circumstances in which hardworking people who have made wise financial decisions still end up struggling financially. But again, let's be honest, in 21st century America, that is not the norm. Uh, most able-bodied people, even without a high school diploma, can get a full-time job, uh, an entry-level job somewhere making $15 an hour. Might not be a great job. But still, our situation is better than the vast majority of people around the world who would love to have the opportunities that we do. And so while we need to warn, as Scripture does, about the dangers of riches, and we will in a moment, and how easy it is to love money, we need to balance this out so that we're not just condoning laziness or foolish use of finances. Uh, one more note on this before we move on. <clears throat> As we've seen hinted at already, the Bible advocates that we work diligently to earn our money. Uh, trying to acquire wealth by some means that uh, circumvents diligent work is not biblical. I think this is one of the reasons that diligent work is, is good for us. It's not just about us gaining money. Okay, that's obviously one result of hard work, but it's also just good for us to have the character to get up and work. Uh, Proverbs 28 verse 19, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. And so there's a contrast here between the faithful, hardworking man who gets up day after day and works year after year, and he has his needs met and his blessing in his life. And then you have 
uh, versus the, the one who follows worthless pursuits and tries to get rich quickly without too much work. And so the biblical teaching is that we are to earn our money by work, not by looking for some get-rich-quick scheme. Uh, the way that God instructs us to care for our needs is to go to work, and then the next day get up and go to work again. It's hard, it's boring, it's tedious, and it's biblical. Get a job and work. Now, you might have an idea about how to make some extra money. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I had an idea in high school to sell ties on eBay, and I've been doing it for years uh, ever since. But rarely does something like that uh, work as a long-term means of paying all your bills and providing all of your needs. Okay, if you have a great idea of how to make money, you invent something, great. Uh, but again, let's be honest, for the vast majority of us, the way that our bills are going to be paid and the way that we're going to have money to save and to give is by going to work day after day. And the reason many people try to find every other possible means of making money is because of our tendency toward laziness. We want some way of paying all of our bills, having some left over for spending and giving to certain things, and we want to stay home, have our own schedule, work as little as possible, but still get all the money that we want. And again, for the vast majority of us, <clears throat> that is not going to work out so well. And so the biblical teaching on uh, finances and how we acquire them is get a job, go to work, do it again the next day. This is how most of us need to be providing for ourselves and how we will have some left over to give and to use. And so Christians should work hard and Christians should make money. As Proverbs indicates, generally speaking, diligent work combined with wise handling of finances leads to prosperity. And this is, of course, especially true in a free market economy like we live in America. I know there are some circumstances, again, in which things happen, mistakes may be made, and you might be in a financial pickle. But generally speaking, it is not a good mark of a Christian's character to be in debt all the time, to not be able to pay your bills, to not be able to give. Uh, maybe you just had a string of bad luck. Maybe some circumstances are outside of your control. But often, if we're honest, the reason we're in financial difficulties is at least partly our own fault either because of laziness or poor planning or mishandling of finances. And the solution to that is go get a stable job and work hard day after day. Uh, this sermon is going to, to gain me a lot of popularity points, can't you tell? I'm hitting the workaholics, the lazy people, the rich, the poor. I'm just putting everybody on blast this morning. Okay, so Christians ought to work hard. We have to save up, but the goal in all of that should never be bigger barns and lavish living. Uh, the goal as a Christian is giving. We work in order to have to give. Uh, we save, we plan wisely in order to pay our bills, take care of those under our watch, and also give generously to kingdom advancement. And this is the second half of this point that we're on here. Christians should work hard and earn money, but not ultimately for ourselves. If we're doing all of that diligent work and financial planning in order to be set for life and sit back and enjoy your wealth, that is seeking to be rich, which was point two. Don't do that. Uh, we work hard in order to have to give. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. By the way, notice in these verses that Paul does not say to Timothy, uh, tell the rich people in your church to give away everything they have to follow Jesus. Which again, that is what, what Jesus said to the rich ruler in Luke 18. But he is the only person ever told to do that in all of scripture. This was not meant to be a universal command for anybody with money that you should just give everything away. It was specific instructions to him because of his problem with greed. But generally speaking, these instructions in 1 Timothy 6 are for all of us, anyone who has uh, money. Uh, first of all, in verse 17, don't be haughty, don't be proud, okay? don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, don't trust in your riches, but trust God. And then verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And so Christians should work hard, but not be motivated by personal wealth. Christians should save and plan wisely with our money. And in America, again, if you work diligently, you save, you follow biblical principles of financial wisdom, you are likely to become successful, at least to some extent. And this is where the balanced warnings of Scripture come in. Okay, you've worked hard, you've, you've saved up, you've planned wisely, now you have some money. Don't set your heart on it. Don't keep chasing after more. Keep your focus on the kingdom. As Christians, 
We ought to consider how God would have us use that money. It wasn't given to us so that we can simply live it up here and now. Remember Jesus' words back in Luke 12. He told them this parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought within himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. He said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And most of us Americans would say to that, uh, that's a good retirement plan. That's being wise. Here's what God thinks of that. Verse 20, God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So is it wrong to save money? Is it, is it wrong to plan for the future? Is it a sin to have an IRA? I, I certainly hope not because I have one. Okay, is it wrong to save for the future? No, Proverbs tells us uh, that a wise person stores up money for those seasons of life that are unexpected. And so it is wise to save. It is wise to plan for the future. But uh, there is a sense in which saving up a large stock of money can be wrong. If you're saving up money so that you can sit back and eat and drink and live in excess for the last few decades of your life, that is foolish. That is sinful, and that will keep you from the kingdom of God. But if you save and plan well financially for your future in order to give and spend your life in service to Christ, then it's wise. The key isn't how much you make, but whether you are rich toward God. Notice that last verse. Uh, Jesus says, this is the person who lays up treasure for himself and isn't rich towards God. He's thinking only about himself, not God's kingdom. So the antidote to covetousness and greed isn't to just not make money. Uh, keep yourself poor in order to not be greedy and focused on money. No, that's the unrighteous poor. That's the lazy, foolish uh, financial management. The way to make sure that our heart is not set on finances, that we're not becoming lovers of money and a servant of money, is to give generously. Make money. Make lots of money. Work diligently, but be rich towards God. Don't forget the one who gives us all things. And so then, Christians are to make money, but not for personal pleasure and lavish living. We are to work diligently, save wisely, and give generously. And so if you don't have much money and you're broke all the time, you should ask yourself, is this my fault? Am I lazy? Am I unwise in how I handle finances? On the other hand, if you have some money, you should ask yourself, am I seeking my own desires or am I using my money for the Lord's work? All of us should work and earn money in order to give, not just to gain for ourselves. Point number four, again, this is overlapping here. If riches increase, don't lose your focus on Christ. Psalm 62, verse 8, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in exhortation. Set no uh, vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Your financial status could always change. This is the rude awakening uh, that many people have when the stock market crashes, when inflation hits, and suddenly that stockpile that they thought they had is gone. And so God tells us, don't set your heart on money. Don't trust in riches. Trust in God. The temptation for many who gain wealth is to think, I don't need God anymore. Jeremiah 9 verse 23, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Don't let your life become all about the acquisition of wealth. It's so easy when you start making more money for that to just consume you. And pretty soon it's all you think about and it's the focus of your life. And meanwhile, your family is falling apart your life is passing you by. You're doing nothing of eternal significance. But man, that bank account is looking great. That business is becoming very successful. Don't fall into the trap of riches. Money can so easily distract us from what matters most in life. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 12, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Guard your heart against greed for more. Be content with what God has given you. Work hard to earn, 
But don't let your focus be on acquiring more and more wealth. That is not what life is all about. Number five, two more points quickly. All disciples of Jesus are called to sacrifice financially. If you're a Christian, that will affect how you handle your finances. There's a real connection in Jesus' teaching between how we handle money and whether or not we are a true disciple. It's almost like a litmus test. Like you can tell if someone is serious about following Jesus by looking at their checkbook. Because how we use our money reflects what we treasure most. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What does the way that you use your money say about your passion for God's kingdom spreading? As we saw last week, when Zacchaeus was converted to Christ, he immediately had a radically different view of his money. He said he would give half of it away. And Jesus said that that was evidence that he had been converted. Here in Luke 18, in our text, Jesus calls this rich ruler to sacrifice all of his wealth to follow him. And his unwillingness to do so meant that he wasn't able to enter the kingdom. In Acts chapter 5, we're told of a man named Barnabas who sells a field and he gives the money that he made from it to the church in Jerusalem. And so we can see throughout the New Testament that one of the marks of genuine Christianity is making financial sacrifices for the kingdom of God. There's no hard and fast rule about how much different people are called to give differently. But we are all to consider what can we do for the advancement of God's kingdom. Money is a tool. Uh, It can be used for selfish reasons or for good reasons. And as Christians who claim that Jesus is our Lord, uh, we use money to serve him. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 16, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? If you have not been faithful in that which is in others, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so money is a great tool, but it's a horrible master. That's really the key to everything we've seen so far. The danger of wealth is that we can so easily end up serving money or using money to serve ourselves instead of serving Christ. Keep Jesus as your Lord and use whatever money you have in service to him. There's nothing wrong with wealth so long as we understand it ultimately belongs to God. And as long as we keep our focus on him. All disciples of Christ are called to make financial sacrifices for the kingdom of God. Last point. Whatever sacrifices we make, they will be repaid. The call to follow Jesus is a call to submit our lives to his lordship. And that includes financial sacrifices. But those will be repaid ultimately. Uh, Back to our text, the last few verses there, verse 28. Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And they really did. He's not exaggerating there. I mean, Matthew gave up his tax franchise to follow Jesus. Peter gave up his profitable fishing business to preach the gospel. These men made huge sacrifices for Christ and his kingdom. In verse 29, Jesus says to them, truly I say to you, There is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. The rich young ruler in Luke 18 made a very poor decision. He wanted to cling to his wealth instead of giving it up to follow Jesus and be repaid many times more. And so the question that each of us needs to consider is what is it that's keeping us from surrendering our lives to Jesus' lordship? What area of your life is off limits to his rule? Is it worth forfeiting eternal life and the blessings of following Christ? I wonder, do you think the rich young ruler regrets his decision? Now that he's been in eternity for 2,000 years, were those few fleeting years of wealth and comfort worth it? This is what Peter, I think, is asking in this question. He says, we've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. Can you assure us that we've made the right decision? This has cost us a lot. What What will we gain? Uh, Matthew's account of this says it this way. Uh, Peter says, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone 
who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Those who sacrificed greatly in a life of service to Christ will spend eternity reaping the benefits of that wise choice. We aren't called ultimately to throw our lives away, but to save them. We don't give anything up. We lay it up for ourselves in heaven. And so six points about finances we learn from Scripture. The first five are commands. The last is a promise. Number one, we are to value Christ above wealth. Number two, we are not to seek to become rich. Number three, we should work hard to earn money, but not ultimately for ourselves. Number four, if our income increases, we must not lose our focus on Christ. Number five, we are all called to sacrifice financially for the sake of the kingdom. And then the promise, number six, whatever sacrifices we make for Christ, they will be repaid eternally. So the question is, do we believe this? If we do, be like the man who gave up everything joyfully to purchase the treasure which is Christ. Give your life to him. Surrender your finances to his control. And you will reap blessings 100 times what you sacrifice, both now and forever. We hope the message you just heard was helpful to you. It means a lot to us that you would join us for this podcast. For more information about our church and meeting times, visit lbcmiller.com or call us at 219-885-9303. We would love to hear from you.